Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, uh, we uh, did a session, uh, which was a workshop, on this same topic yesterday. And uh, fortunately, but unfortunately, we had such great turnout that we had to turn some folks away. So we decided to do a second round of it today. So if you were in that session yesterday, uh, a lot of what we cover is going to sound very similar and very familiar to you. Um, but um, certainly hope that you'll be able to get something else or something additional out of this. So uh, to introduce myself, Jamie Jeff, um, I had the customer success consulting practice at Coastal Cloud. Uh, prior to Coastal Cloud, uh, I was a chief customer officer at two different SaaS businesses. So have spent a lot of time in your shoes um, working through a lot of the common challenges and, and opportunities with designing um, effective and, and productive customer onboarding programs. So what we're going to do here um, is we're going to walk through a kind of five-point framework that I like to use in thinking about customer onboarding. And I'm going to try to move through the framework relatively quickly so that we can have as much time at the end for Q&A. Uh, we found, especially yesterday, that a lot of the discussion and the questions really helped kind of the group get to a good level of depth um, around the particular challenges that folks in the audience were facing. So I start off. Um, with a little story that, that I've used to really inspire me as I think about um, my, my chosen profession in the world of customer success and uh, specifically how um, it relates to the onboarding part of the journey. So uh, for those of you who don't recognize this guy, uh, his name is Benjamin Zander. And he is uh, the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. And he, he put on uh, one of the most popular TED Talks about 10 years ago. And the theme of his presentation was he was striving to get more people to appreciate classical music. And he shared this quote that um, only about 3% of the population considers them fans of classical music. And obviously, given his job, he'd like to see that, that number grow. And so as he begins his presentation, he starts by educating the audience on how to listen to classical music and, and what to listen for. And he explains that you know, the, your ear, as you're listening to music, um, is a very good ch judge of tone, and so can recognize notes that are on key and off key. And uh, it, it creates a little bit of kind of frustration and stress when you hear an off key note. And so what the best composers do as they're forming a melody and, and playing a song as those notes move along, um, they will start to tease your ear with that note that you're listening for, that on-key note that kind of concludes um, that part of the music. And they'll, they'll get close to it, but then they'll play a note that's maybe a little bit sharp or a little bit flat. And that's what keeps you engaged in the song. And, and so at the point then when they finally build to that climax and hit the on-key note, you can literally feel it in your body. It's like, ah, OK, there, there was the moment that I was looking for, um, and kind of relieving that stress that you were feeling by not hearing it. So as he's, as he's going through this explanation, he then uh, says, OK, I'm going to play this song now from start to finish. And as I'm doing that, I want you to really kind of, in your mind, trace the line from the beginning, follow all of those teases along the way, to that final note of closure when, when I finally hit that on key note, and, and think about how that feels. But he says, while you're listening and following that line from start to finish, I want you to picture someone in your life who you have loved, and who you've lost, someone that is no longer with us anymore. And think about and picture that person and the time spent with them while you're following along with the music. So as you can imagine, um, he, he plays this piece, and he builds and hits that final note. And you can literally just kind of feel that note hanging in the air. And it's kind of vibrating. And if you're watching it, um, I am certain that you will feel kind of the emotional connectivity of thinking about this person who, who you've loved and, and who has passed away. 
And so it's an incredibly powerful moment, even just having watched uh, a clip of it online as they pan to the audience. And first of all, every set of eyes in the room is, is locked in on him. And there's not a single set of dry eyes in the audience. This is an incredibly powerful moment. And so he stands up and he says, you know, I, I described this presentation as trying to get more people to appreciate classical music. But what I've come to realize through the work that I do is that as I look at an audience like this, that there, there is joy in having shining eyes like this around me. And so he said he's really come to define success for him in life is having as many shining eyes around him as possible. And he continues from there to say, you know, as a conductor, um, I don't make a single sound, right? It is, it is the musicians in front of me who are making the music. And, and so my power really comes as the conductor from the power that I'm able to, to give and expose in those musicians who, are, who I am leading, right? And he specifically says, you know, what, what I really see my role as doing is to awaken possibilities in others. And so the first time that I watched this, I um, um, kind of, my mind was blown, right? And I kind of pushed back from the laptop and was like, okay, what, how does this relate to, you know, what I do in the world of customer success? And for me, as I'm sure many of you, you know, I very much hate um, seeing people get let down, right? And in the role of customer success, that's a big part of our job, right? Customers come to us and they have bought a product or a service expecting to get some benefit. And it's our job to really deliver that value and ensure that they don't get let down by that experience, right? And so we're very much in a similar role of kind of marshalling and quarterbacking and guiding this process to awaken those possibilities within our customers using our products in their relationship with our companies. And so that kind of segues into the topic today of, of customer onboarding, right? This is, this is the customer relationship in its infancy. It is at the point where the, the ink is barely dry on that contract and they are ready to go. They may have been through a several weeks, several months, who knows how long sales process, and they are now ready to begin their relationship with you. And so it is a critical juncture, I'm sure as many of you have found or observed, a, an onboarding gone awry can be a very clear predictor of churn, right? Every day that it takes um, to get that customer onboarded, every bump in that road increases the likelihood that you're gonna have a hard time retaining that customer as they're delayed in, in the value that they're trying to achieve. So a segue now into um, this framework, and we refer to it as the SASE framework, which hopefully is a useful uh, phrase that will resonate since many of us are uh, working for SaaS businesses. And it breaks down into five areas, as you can see up here. First is the, the sales handoff, right? That transition from when the gong stops ringing to when that customer comes over and is now the responsibility of customer success going forward. Second, achieving first value, um, helping your customers get to that point that they bought the product for. Third, segmentation. Um, we could sit in here and probably talk for hours about segmentation alone. So we're gonna skim the surface just with a few key points as it relates to onboarding. Um, but uh, fantastic discussion to dig in deeper another day. Uh, success planning, and then the end of onboarding. This is one of those kind of beginning with the end in mind to help ensure that you have an effective onboarding program. So starting off with the sales handoff, um, I, I view this as, as one of the first and most important places to start because like I said, the customer has just signed and they are at a, a heightened state of excitement and, and of expectation, right? They have gone through a sales process where they have not just bought your product, but they have bought into the promises and the value that you have told them that your product is going to deliver. So it's really important at this stage to maintain and, and really accelerate that excitement, right? Step on the gas, don't step on the brakes at this point and drive them forward because you have a lot of momentum 
And one of the biggest things that can really derail an onboarding program is a loss of momentum, a loss of engagement from the customer. So you need to harness that and seize that. The second point, which is a, is a don't, is this is also a big, easy opportunity to stumble out of the gate, right? Customers hate it when they have spent two, three months with your sales rep, and you get on that kickoff call, and you say, tell me about your goals. Why did you buy our product, right? And how many of them are going to turn around and say, I have been going through this with your sales rep for two to three months now, right? Do you guys, do you sit next to each other? Do you talk to each other? Could you maybe talk to each other before we get on this call? And so having this process well-defined in terms of, you know, what are the areas that are really important for your sales team to capture, right? And, and granted, they're not going to go down to the depth of every sort of corner and nook and cranny that you might need to get to um, as part of onboarding and beyond. But find out those key things that help you really pick up from where the sales process left off and maintain that momentum, maintain that continuity, and maintain that familiarity. Right? Build the trust by showing you've done your internal homework and are ready to go uh, with that customer. The next point is around achieving first value. right? And, and the way that I like to think about this first off and is this is a race to celebrate and race to help the customer celebrate. So again, um, key theme here is one of urgency and, and driving progress forward. So what your customer is really looking for here is that first validation that they made the right call when they bought your product or service, right? And I, I um, often remind you know, um, clients and, and my teams that one of the best ways that you can demonstrate that you've made your customer successful is when they get promoted from choosing to work with you, right? And so what they're really looking for as, as a champion of purchasing your product is that very early point where they can go back to their company, back to their boss, whoever they put their neck on the line to secure that budget and to say, see, it's working, right? This is why we bought it and look how soon we're getting that, that benefit. And so in many cases, and this certainly, there's a lot of diversity out there in terms of companies, products, customers, et cetera. But what you really need to look to do is identify that point where your relationship and, and their engagement with you turns the corner. Right? And, and it's important to think about this in terms of validating their business case for why they bought. This first value point is not like um, they logged in the first time. Right? It's not, we got everyone on your team registered. Those things all need to happen. But nobody is going to celebrate that they have a login. Right? That is not proof that they made the right investment in your product. So one example I like to give here is um, I used to work at a, a, a SaaS online community platform company. And with online communities, there's this point of inertia where there's enough engagement within the community of everybody participating that it kind of takes hold and starts to feed and live on its own, right? Because people are asking questions, answering questions, and they're interacting with each other. And so that was a very important milestone with any customer at that company was getting to that momentum point where the community is self-sufficient. Because every day that, that we were delayed in getting to that point, it was harder and harder to achieve that point. And you start to lose the, the mental buy-in from the customer, and the doubt starts to creep in. And they start to wonder, maybe this isn't a fit for us. Maybe our users or our members aren't the right sort of people for this platform. right? And so whenever you have that doubt creep in, pulling it back from the edge uh, just adds to those sorts of hurdles during onboarding. So segmentation is, is the next piece um, that we'll talk about. And, and three quick points here. First, um, you know, I've I spoken with dozens and dozens of companies and, and particularly asked them about how they go about segmenting their customer base. And it's very common and understandably so why many companies use either how much are they paying us or how big is this customer to segment customers into enterprise, mid-market, and SMB, right? And 
there are certainly reasons why your company would want to do that to understand, are we profitably servicing this customer, right? Let's not throw super high touch, um, very hands-on customer success against a customer base um, that is paying us $5,000 per year, right? It doesn't scale, and it certainly doesn't scale uh, profitably. However, um, I encourage you not to stop there, right? Because within any of those tiers, there are other facets that are equally, and in many cases, more important. And, and sophistication of your customer starting with you is one uh, very good example that, that is really important to factor into your design. So many of you in, in your customer situations, I would expect, and, and I had uh, one of my prior companies, we had customers who were um, digital marketing uh, customers. And some of them would come to us and say, we bought the product, but we're also looking to learn because we haven't really been very data driven in our marketing. And we're hoping that you can teach us how to be more data driven by using your product. And for every one of those, there's a customer on the other end of the perspective, or other end of the spectrum, who would come to us and say, look, we know what we're doing. I've actually used your product at two prior companies. Um, we're actually more quantitative than you guys. So just like give us access to the product and get out of the way, right? Two very different customer levels of sophistication starting with us, and they should absolutely have very different onboarding experiences. In the first case, we need to take them by the hand and share with them kind of, here are the basics, here are the best practices, here's why you do some of this stuff. The other customer, we're really looking to help drive and accelerate them forward and, and get out of their way when, when they want us out of their way. The other point here to factor in is use case, right? Just because your product can do 10 things doesn't mean that your onboarding should treat all 10 of those things equally with every customer. If they bought for number one and number seven, focus your onboarding on those. You'll get to those other items down the road, but focus your time with them so that you're not wasting their time getting to the things that are most important to them. On to success planning then. Success planning is a great concept that is often not kind of concretely understood what it means. So I'll start with the second bullet point first. A success plan is not your technical project plan. This is not like these are the steps that we need to do to integrate our product with your backend systems. You absolutely need a project plan to do all those things. Um, so I'm not saying discard that. A success plan is separate and parallel to it. Think about this as a plan that is mutually agreed to with the customer that drives towards incrementally and increasingly validating their business case, right? This is achievement of ROI sorts of milestones along their partnership with you. So I, I, I like to use um, DocuSign as an example here. So if DocuSign brings in a new customer, maybe that new customer says, our goal is to replace the 10,000 paper signatures that we're doing every year with electronic signatures. So your technical project plan might say, OK, uh, on week one, we're going to integrate DocuSign with Salesforce, right? But there's no real value that has been delivered by that. It's a step that has to happen. The success plan likely looks more like, OK, we're going to first roll this out and replace 100 of your new employee onboarding paper signatures with electronic signatures. And then we're going to expand that 100 to be all 1,000 of your legal contracts that are coming through. Um, and, and then we're building over time and setting the time frame for expanding out and hitting that point where we have now deployed to all 10,000 signatures. The paper is out, and they're all electronic. And so what's key here is, as you think about that process, DocuSign does not have the ability to physically make sure that that sort of expansive rollout at that customer takes place, right? Which is why, as we come back to the first point here, this is a handshake relationship. These are not just steps that you, as the software vendor, are taking. There are steps that the customer has skin in the game as well. Right? and milestones that they need to hit that you can point to to say, hey, we need to do this, you need to do this. When we've done those things, here's the business benefit that you're going to get out of that. Right? 
And that kind of hits on the last point. Success plan is a great anchor for when you do QBRs or any sort of engagement and value-oriented call. Uh, I very much am not a fan of the generic customer success check-in call, right? Nobody has time for you just to check in. Um, nobody gets value out of you just checking in. You need to strike the right balance between give and get with the customer, right? If you're just calling to check in, that is a purely get call. It's, I just want to see how things are going to make sure that everything's OK. You need to give. And, and using a success plan is a big give, where you can educate and say, here's where we are along this path towards achieving the business benefit that you sought by working with our company. The last piece, then, is, is the end. And one of the things I, I've commonly found is, without having put a lot of thought into how your onboarding ends, it becomes this never-ending story where you talk about a given customer and you say, how are they doing in their onboarding? Are we done with onboarding? Well, there's still some stuff we're working on. They're not really adopting this piece, and et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's very vague, right? Are we done or are we not done? That answer should be very clear, right? You should have a very clear set of things, you know, four or five things that say, these are the things on our success plan that have, to be, have been completed. These are the things on our technical project plan. And if they're not done, onboarding's not done. But just as important, arguably more, is how long that should take. Right? You should have a clear position on, and it, this can vary based on different segments, but the, our onboarding should take you two months. It should take you three months. Maybe enterprise, it takes five versus two for SMB. So that those two things together allow you to effectively measure how are we doing. Right? Are we typically on time? Are we typically early? Are we typically late? If we're late, which of those discrete steps that we say has to get done for onboarding to be done is consistently causing us to be late? Right? And that's where you can then kind of turn the wheel and continue to improve your onboarding programs. If you find step number four out of five is 90% of the time that holds us up, drill in there and figure out what you need to do or how you need to coach your customers differently so that that step in the process goes a lot more cleanly and efficiently. So all right, um, that, that is the last step in the framework. I'm going to flip back to the outline that just kind of shares everything here. I think that's all the time we have for today. Okay. Um, closing is going to start sh shortly downstairs. Um, let's give Jamie a round of applause.